Good afternoon. Well, in the summer, as you know, we've been kind of jumping around the Psalms a little bit. And that's what we're still doing at the moment. So if you would turn in your Bibles to what I hope is a shorter study this afternoon, that's the plan. And it's Psalm 73. Psalm 73, which is a well-known psalm. Uh, but as you can see, it's quite a long psalm. We're actually just going to look at the last portion of this well-known psalm, seeing as it is or should be very well known to most of us, and we kind of know the theme of this psalm. And uh, I've kind of avoided this psalm because it's one that's referred to often, and it's fairly well known, until I read it again, and then I decided, well, the last verses in this psalm, by myself anyway, are often overlooked. Um, in place of the main theme of the psalm, as it were. So let's start by reading together from verses 23 to 28. Just those verses, we will not read the whole psalm. Psalm 73 and verse 23 to the end to 28. After these things and the psalmist's perplexities and uh, the destiny of the wicked that is revealed to the psalmist, with all the questions that were in his heart, his soul seems to be satisfied, as it were. And we read in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, as they nearly did in this psalm, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You will put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. And then he repeats, but for me, it is good to be near God. My refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Psalm 73 is a well-known psalm, as I said. It's a psalm of Asaph and often referenced and preached on. This is most likely because it represent, presents the world and the Christian with the question of the apparent imbalance and injustice in the world, especially when we consider the prosperity of the wicked. Those who are wicked, who don't choose God, who don't trust God, and yet they seem to prosper. And the pure in heart are the ones who seem to suffer. And other questions of suffering in the world. And so, perhaps, as the psalm is thinking about this, just to fill us in on the first part of the psalm, this is, from the unbeliever's perspective, where's God? Where is your God? He seems to have lost contact with what's going on here in the world. If God was real, why is there so much suffering? Why are the Christians oppressed? You're the good guys, and you're always suffering, and you're always sick, and you're being punished. Not often wealthy by worldly standards, often afflicted, persecuted, scorned by the world. If God was real, why do you suffer? Why do you not prosper in this life? Have less illness. And the wicked say, I do not need God. I'm prosperous. I'm popular. I have power and wealth. I have everything I need in this world. I'm the master of my own destiny. I am happy and fulfilled. So these are the taunting thoughts in the mind of the psalmist in particular. These wicked, arrogant people who hate God. Why do they prosper? Why do they pr This is perplexing. For the psalmist and the believer's experience, and he views these apparent realities of the world, and he questions the same things. And Asaph struggled with some of these questions. And he's viewing the wicked man's prosperity and the happiness in the world and the injustice of that. And he's perplexed. This psalm opens beautifully. It acknowledges God's goodness to his people who are pure in heart. And then these other thoughts flood his mind. Look at verse 3. For I was envious. 
of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The thoughts of the prosperity of the wicked plagued the psalmist's mind. Lord, what about the righteous ones? He seems to be saying, the pure in heart, the devout, and the love, those the man who has named God as his God. It seems unfair. And Lord, it seems the psalm say, I'm even a little embarrassed before the wicked when they strut in their arrogance, all the while oppressing their neighbor, getting away with murder. And when they're brought before an earthly judge, breaking the law, it seems that their wallet's still full. They walk away unscathed. That's with the slap on their wrist. The psalm and even acknowledges that these unanswered questions nearly cause his foot to slip. And the world entices him away and says, forget your faith. God is not there for you. Come this way. And he doubts. And he seems to have no answer to the wicked and their taunting and proud statements. In verse 11 we see there, and they say, how could God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked always at ease. They increase in riches. Well, you know how the psalm goes. I'm not going to go through the whole psalm. No wonder if I had to ask you today, what is the message of Psalm 73? You would most likely answer me just like that. It deals with the prosperity, the question of prosperity of the wicked in the light of the the struggles and the poverty and the afflictions of the pure in heart and the injustice thereof. The perplexity of the success and ease of the wicked. And you would say, possibly, rightly so. And the answer comes in verse 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to be a wearisome task. Until I went to the sanctuary of God... Then I discerned their end. And the psalm talks about the troubles that will come to the wicked in the day of judgment. And you'd be right in saying that as a lesson. But today, rather, I want us to examine what it was that kept the psalmist's foot from slipping. From becoming doubt or having doubt as to his faith in God. And perhaps even, he said, my foot nearly slipped even forsaking the path of the righteous. And the questions that you have in your mind and that unbelievers throw in your face, why is there suffering? I thought God was a good God. All of these things sometimes play even on our own minds and they cause us to doubt. For, they are he, for here in the last part of this psalm, there are the real lessons for the faithfulness, the perseverance of the saints in a world of injustice and of imbalances, which is what we have in the world, it seems. It's not enough sometimes to say, well, grin and bear it, Christian, grin and bear it. Their day is coming. So just take the heat. Their day is coming and uh, squash your doubts away. But the fact is we must continue to face trials of many kinds, uh, trials and, uh, of the body and mind and soul, and face ridicule, sometimes persecution. And you continue to be afflicted, perhaps poor, and by worldly standards, unsuccessful, insignificant, and the wicked strut around, prospering. Well, these closing verses of this psalm is the real comfort and strength. And the secret to true prosperity and steadfastness in the Lord, who the psalmist says is his strength and his portion and his help. How does he become his portion, the rock? How does he become your rock and your refuge when you're faced with doubts, when you're faced with your own sin, when you're faced with these perplexing questions of life? Guide. Perhaps he has an answer to our question and a guide for the pure in heart in a sinful and imbalanced and an unjust world. I have just two, two main points this afternoon as we consider these verses from verse 23. Number one, by placing himself in the presence of God. The psalmist places himself 
in the presence of God. And you may think that's a funny way of putting it, but look at verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. So how does a psalmist overcome these perplexities of life, the imbalances, the injustice, prosperity, the wicked? He says, in spite of all these things, I have seen already the, their end, as he pre previously saw in this psalm. But now he says, nevertheless, here's my real comfort. It's almost he say, nevertheless, in spite of all this, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. In spite of all these perplexing questions, despite the prosperity of the wicked, the psalmist continued struggles and suffering, all these doubt-raising thoughts, these things that nearly caused his foot to slip. It is this. Here's his secret. It is my deliberate presence with God that has sustained me. It is my continued deliberate presence with God that has sustained me. And he reaffirms this in the last verse of the psalm. If you would look at that, verse 28, he says again, But for me... It is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I might tell of his good works. And so this phrase may seem a little strange to us. Surely it's the other way around. It is God, it is grace and mercy that draws us. And we are taught that coming to Christ, it is really the work of God by his spirit drawing us near to Christ. And moreover, the fact is that God is everywhere. And the psalmist is no, no doubt aware of this. Is God not here that I need to find him and draw near to him? We know that there is nowhere where God is not. He knows all things. He is present everywhere. We cannot hide from him. We even know that God is in hell, in judgment. God is everywhere Present. Yes, in that place of torment, God is already there in judgment. Yet the psalmist says, draw near to him. I draw near to him. He says, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. And he says again, but for me it is good to be near God. I've made him my refuge that I, must, that I may tell of his good works. In verse 28, the older translations make this a little easier for us to understand. It says there, it is good for me to draw near to God. This God who is everywhere present, who is here, he said, it is good for me to draw near to God. Though God is everywhere, everywhere presence, but sometimes I am not. God is everywhere. And watches over the church and the believer. But the believer in his heart, as Asaph is saying, sometimes I am not. So it is good for me to draw near to God. And we know the scriptures are full of this. Return to me, says the Lord. I am here, but you have forgotten me. Return to me, repent, come to me, call unto me, and I will answer you. And Jesus says, come unto me. All you labor and are heavy laden with your sickness, with your doubts, with your sin, with your difficulties. Come unto me. I am here, but you need to come to me. And the psalmist says, it's good for me to be near God. And this is what sustained him and, caught and stopped his foot from slipping and his faith from failing. When God, who is already near who is a very present help in trouble, yet I go to him. I step into his presence. I draw near to him. Does it not remind you of Sunday worship and the call to worship? We pray sometimes, Lord, may your presence be here with us, and that's a good prayer, but God is here. And he calls us, he says, you step into my presence. It is good for me to draw near to God. And I thought of how to illustrate this. And I think about two little girls who were kind of frightening, frightened when they were little, frightened of the storm, frightened of the boogeyman, 
frightened that then we were teaching our young daughter Jillian that Jesus is everywhere. And she started crying. She, she asked, what's the matter? She said, Jesus is under my bed. And she was afraid at that thought. But little children, mostly, when you put them to bed and they're little, you pray with them and you, you wrap them up, they are so happy. They are so happy and they feel safe. Why? Because even though daddy's gone out of the room and he's gone to do his own thing, the house is quiet, they can sleep because they feel safe because daddy is here and that is what it's like with God. He is here until the thunderstorm comes. And the thunderstorm comes in the middle of the night and there's screaming girls and these two little girls come running into our bedroom under our bed covers and it's like they say, it's good for me to be a near daddy. There I am safe. When I had doubts about, you'll be fine, I'll take care of you, nothing will happen to you. Then a storm comes and then, daddy can't take care of me here. I must draw near to him and so they run to daddy. And this psalmist has found just that, the God who is ever present. But I must draw near to him. And what a blessed thing it is. It is good for me to draw near to God. God who is always near. But we're running off all over the place. And our minds filled with anxieties. And concerns for tomorrow. And for yesterday. And the, 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 for the things that might happen. That plague our minds. Or the things that did happen. It is good for me to draw near to God. This is what the psalmist David expressed. In Psalm 16, in fact, he says the same thing. We study that psalm together. Remember verse 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen in pleasant places for me. I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. Ah, oh, he has drawn near to God. In verse 8 of that psalm too, Psalm 16 I have set the Lord always before me because he is, he mentions the same things, at my right hand, therefore I shall not be shaken. Brothers and sisters, God must be our first thought. God must be our last thought. God is in every thought and word and deed. In Christian, the New Testament scriptures tell us, in him we live and move and have our being. We are hidden with Christ in God. We are safe. Jesus says, come unto me. God says, return to me. God says, repent. Step into the presence of God. And this is where the psalmist found his solace and his strength by being in the presence of God, sheltered and protected by that rock which is higher than I. In every circumstance of life, brothers and sisters, in your workplace, in the frustrations, in your marriage, in your sin, in your unfaithfulness, in your doubting heart, I learned to draw near to God. And He is already near and ready to receive me in times of want and fear and despair. And that when I am in need of wisdom and counsel, that's what the psalmist is talking about. It is good for me to draw near to God because he is here to counsel, to love, to protect, to forgive, and to comfort us in our affliction. And this helped the psalmist move his focus from the ungodly, the arrogant, who don't believe in God and who scorn you. We of course taught this in the New Testament, the book of James, chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God. Take the step. Come into God's presence and he will draw near to you. Brothers and sisters, is this not our sanctification? In our salvation we are drawn irresistibly by the Father, through the Spirit, to his, through His Spirit, by the Son, we're given a faith to believe on Him for the forgiveness of sin. And nothing is possible with this first. No protection, no refuge from the storm, no forgiveness of sin. However, sanctification is a drawing near to God. 
drawing ourselves to God continually through the word of Christ, by the help of his spirit in the church, it is good for me to draw near to God. And notice that this drawing near, this sustaining help, comes to us primarily in the church. In the church. There where the means of grace is distributed to us freely. That is where the best place for us to draw near to God where was the psalmist's heart? Where, where was it that the psalmist's heart was first set at ease by the perplexing questions in his mind? In the sanctuary. That's what it says in verse 16, 17. When I thought to understand this, it seemed a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. There it is where we can draw near to God and in your home, and in your office, and in your car. But here, brothers and sisters, where the people of God gather, this is where the perplexing, perplexing questions of life fly out of our minds. This is where we draw near to God. This is where we understand as His Word counsels us by His Spirit. But when I thought to understand, how to understand it, seemed a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. The importance of forming godly habits starting with the uncompromising habit of observing the Lord's day. This is where we draw near to God. This is where our hearts are counseled. This is where the means of grace is distributed to us and our faith is strengthened drawing near to God who is always nearby. Secondly, our second thing, the second thing that sustained the psalmist, number two, and here we want to talk about the benefits of drawing near to God from the psalmist's own personal testimony, the benefits of drawing near to God. Let's consider the psalmist with the ways in which he was helped, sustained, and blessed continually by being in God's presence and making the Lord his, ref his refuge by drawing near to God. And there are five benefits here for drawing near to God as we close uh, this short study and by way of personal application straight from our text here. Firstly, five things. Number one, God holds my right hand. When I draw near to God, God holds my right hand. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Psalm 16, 8, which we referenced, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. God is at our dominant hand. The easiest place, have you ever walked and stumbled on something? You put out your left arm? No, you don't. You put out your right arm. That's the easiest way to get help. It's your stronger arm. But God is holding my right hand. And this is the benefit of drawing near to God. And it's a very personal thing, isn't it? Holding hands, we hold hands with our wives. There's love shown and there's comfort given in that. And the Lord, our shepherd, he holds our right hand to know the Lord's strength and help which is communicated to the believer by the word and through the spirit scriptures teach us don't they that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus when we come into his presence he holds our right hands Christ is always near and he will hold you fast but you can't hold someone's hand, literally, unless you go up to them and take their hand. God holds my right hand when I draw near to him. Secondly, drawing near to God, God is my counselor. The benefit of drawing near to God, brothers and sisters, in the morning when you wake up, in the evening as your day closes, when you're faced with temptation, come unto me, says Jesus, draw near to God. You guide me with your counsel. Verse 24, 
Those are the words. You guide me with your counsel. It is the whole law of God and the law of Christ, which is our counsel and our guide. Jesus, who is mighty God, is named the counselor, mighty God, drawing near to God and being counseled by him. How does this happen? Well, it's supernatural. Yes, it is supernatural, but it is through the word of faith which is near us, even in our hearts. It is the written word of God, the whole law of God that the believer can lean on, can glean wisdom from. And it is that word which sanctifies him. In Psalm 19, which is another beautiful psalm, perhaps we look at that in the future, it talks about the, the law of God and through it, the counsel that we receive through the precious word of God. Verse 7 and 8 of that word, the law of the Lord revives the soul. It revives the soul. He gives me counsel. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The promises are yea and amen, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Brothers and sisters, draw near to God. He guides me with his counsel. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And all this, of course, is preparing us for the greater things when on the last day we will be fully prepared. Pastor Sam reminded us of that this morning. And the counsel of the word of God will be effectively completed in us when Christ comes again in the splendor of his glory, he counsels me. Number three, God will bring me to glory. Here is a wonderful truth and a great comfort for the suffering believer, for the tried saint. God will bring me to glory. Verse 24 and 25, and afterwards, afterwards this after my stumbling, after my perplexing questions, after you counsel me with your word, after I draw near to you and you take my right hand, and afterwards you will receive me to glory. And he burst forth. He said, who am I? Who am, who am I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire more besides you. Even the wicked with his prosperity and his fatness and his seemed happiness in this world pales into insignificance. Whom have I in heaven but you? God will bring me to glory. Colossians 3, 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And Paul writes in Titus, 1, Titus 2, 3, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the, th the third benefit. The fourth benefit, number four, God will sustain me and vindicate his church. God will sustain me and vindicate his church. My flesh and my heart, verse 26, may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever, when I draw near to him. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You will put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. His first perplexing question is there answered, and God will sustain his foot from slipping. God will give him more grace. God will increase our faith as he counsels us with his word. And the psalmist draws near, for there where God rolls his right hand, he finds no confidence in the flesh, but at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. At his right hand, his failing heart and weak faith is strengthened. Christian perseverance is not digging deep and finding the strength somewhere down there to overcome the trials and temptations of life, but drawing near to God who supplies us through the Spirit and the Word with God's strength, and it is that that will sustain you. And that is how God sustains you when you draw near to him. 
This is what assures us of perseverance in the faith until he comes or calls. Consider the quote in our bulletin today. I think Kim put that in there, not with reference to my sermon, perhaps not. Here it is. Perseverance is not found after one or two afflictions, but after we are exercised and acquainted with them. Trees often shaken are deeply rooted. That's Thomas Manton. And furthermore, he reiterates the perplexities of life, the injustices and imbalance of this life, leaves my heart at peace. For when I am near God, God will judge and determine the end of the wicked. That need not plague my mind. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You will put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to draw near to God. The fifth and final point, God will glorify his name through the church. God will glorify his name through the church. As the psalmist repeats the first call to draw near to God who is ever present, we are reminded again that all things, even our preservation and continued sanctification, this is all that we may declare his praises and tell of his good works. Verse 28, but for me it is good to draw near, to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of his good works. And let's not forget that part. That is why God sustains us. That is why God sanctifies us. That is why God brings us through the trials of life and sickness and anxieties so that we may, after being counseled by God, after being held by our right hands, after all of these things, that we may tell of his good works. And that is why we are here today to tell of his good works. Brothers and sisters, live to and for God's glory Tell of all his wonders, especially the gift of his son in his suffering and death and what it accomplished for his people. And this we do today as we come to the Lord's table again to tell of his good works as we proclaim his death until he comes. God sustains us and he keeps us. He holds our right hand. He guides us with his counsel. He fills us with his spirit that we may tell of his good works. All glory be to God most high, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God that we need not go out and seek because you are there. Call unto me, and I will answer you, your word tells us. It is good for me that I draw near to God. Oh, Lord, how we thank you in all the perplexities of life, in all our anxieties, in our failings, in our sin, in our shortcomings, when our foot nearly slips. It is good for us to draw near to God. Oh, Lord, help us to love your house where we meet with your children and declare all your wondrous good works. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are a heavenly Father who holds us fast, who sustains us, and who counsels us, and who will bring us to glory. Oh, Lord, may we declare the wonders of your goodness and your works and your faithfulness to us in the congregation of the righteous. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.